Hi everyone, today we'll be talking about the cell. And so when we discuss cells and relate them to working in a biology classroom or a lab, how we study cells are through a process called microscopy. And so microscopes are used in order to study cells because cells are very, very small. And cells are small for a reason. Um, that's how they can get nutrients in really quickly towards the center of the cell and how they can expel waste very quickly. If you remember back to our first uh, discussion on introduction to biology, cells are essentially the basic units of life. Um, and they have many specific features to them that we will discuss today. All living things are made up of cells. And so microscopes helped us to examine cells in order to figure out what cells are made of and what they do. And so within the classroom, there are two, or within a lab, there are two ways you can study cells using a microscope. And uh, th these are not uh, all limiting ways to do it. There are different types of these microscopes. But in any case, there are two groups of microscopes and they're called light microscopes and electron microscopes. So light microscopes um, have a light, which it gives you it, it, the name, and it's over here on the left-hand side of this picture. So you see this microscope, it has a light at the very bottom, and essentially you look through these lenses here, and these are called um, ocular lenses, and you can adjust the magnification. So how many times you're magnifying or enlarging the image of the cell that you're looking at. So these are called your objective lenses. And here you have some adjustment knobs on both sides of the microscope as to how you can um, uh, clearly see or clarify the image. And that's called your resolving power. So um, many types of light microscopes are used by students across various uh, organizations. And light microscopes are good, but they really only have a particular magnification range that you can look at. So oftentimes the light microscopes used in the classroom are around three to 400 times. So that means you can magnify three or 400 times the size of the image in order to see it. And this works for many different types of cells or organisms. But for those that are much smaller, it, it would be difficult to use this type of microscope. Some light microscopes can get up to a thousand times and that helps with uh, the magnification. Uh, however, it's really the electron microscopes over here on the right hand side that you would need in order to see very small um, components of cells. And so when studying really tiny components of cells, uh, you would be using electron microscopes, which use a beam of electrons in order to resolve an image. And those are much more high tech. They are much larger. Um, they usually have a computer screen attached so that you can see the image. And unfortunately, the downside to them, although you can magnify uh, up to a million times magnification, the downside is you cannot look at living things. Whereas with a light microscope, you could technically suspend something in water and observe living things uh, because the light does not kill the specimen. In an electron microscope, um, uh, the way it works, it would kill the specimen, so the specimen must be chemically fixed to the slide beforehand and hence dead. So there are advantages to a light microscope, uh, but certainly the electron microscopes can allow you to see in greater detail cellular structure. So when we think about different cells and components of cells, we can look at this uh, scale, which shows you what you could see with the naked eye, a light microscope versus electron microscope. And here's some relative sizing from things that are one meter in length down to 0 0.1 nanometers. And so these are extremely tiny objects that we would not be able to see without an electron microscope. So there is some overlap, as you can see, with these um, uh, scales and numbers, 
but generally for anything inside of a cell or small viruses or proteins, you need electron microscopes and even down to the atom components. Whereas with light microscopes, you can see larger cells like animal and plant cells and maybe some types of bacteria that are larger. And then with the naked eye, you can see a few things outlined here on this picture. Another source where you can see an image like this is on learngenetics.com. If you type in Learn Genetics into Google, it will bring you to the first website, which is Learn Genetics from the University of Utah. And if you look under cell biology and click on amazing cells, scroll down and click on cell size and scale, you actually have a similar scale here. And it shows you what a meter, centimeter, millimeter, micrometer, and nanometer uh, refer to. So nanometer on our scale was 10 to the negative six meters, or sorry, 10 to the negative nine meters, which is very small. Micrometers are 10 to the negative six, milli is 10 to the negative three, and so forth. And so when you look at this image, you can actually just scroll down. So it compares everything to your starting size, which is a paper with a 12 point font on it. And then it gets smaller and smaller and it gives you the size of various objects as you keep uh, zooming in. So an amoeba, for example, is 500 micrometers. Uh, so 10 to the negative six meters. Paramecium, human egg, and then even smaller. So things you would need electron microscopes for are for observation of really small cells. There's red blood cells here, the X chromosome, and a chromosome is a wrapped up piece of DNA. Um, e. coli bacterium, lysosomes, which are components found in cells, mitochondria, which is again a component found in cells, and then very tiny viruses, which you definitely need electron microscopes for, like HIV, influenza, and measles. Um, and as you keep going, it brings you to the smallest form, the carbon atom. So you can always have a look at the scale to gauge uh, different sizes of things. Going back to the PowerPoint, um, what scientists noted back in the 1600s when the first microscope was discovered, and Antoine van Leeuwenhoek was the one who generated the first microscope, it was actually pretty good, 300 times the magnification. Since then, um, scientists had used microscopes to look at different cells, and in the 1800s, the unified cell theory came out. And the theory is listed here. So these are three parts of the cell theory. All living things are composed of one or more cells. So we do have certain protozoans that are just made up of one cell. They are called unicellular. And then we have other complex organis uh, or organisms made up of more than one cell. So they're called multicellular. The cell is the basic unit of life and new cells arise from pre-existing cells. So you can only generate a cell by copying a pre-existing cell. So that is the basis of cell division, which is mitosis that we will talk about later on in the semester. So cells are divided into two categories. We have those that are called prokaryotic cells and those that are called eukaryotic cells. And really the main difference is Prokaryotic cells are your smaller, less complex cells, like those that make up bacteria, and eukaryotic cells, which is in the next couple of slides, are your more highly complex cells that make up animals and plants. And so here is a picture of a prokaryotic cell in its idealized image. Uh, not this is not all-encompassing, so not everything is shown here, but this is the general information and these are the general components of the prokaryotic cell. So, firstly, starting with the outside, uh, every cell, no matter if you're pro or eukaryotic, you have what's called a cell membrane. And a cell membrane here is shown in this green outer image or outer circle that encompasses everything that's inside of the cell. So this green area here is a cell membrane. 
all cells have it. It's not specific to prokaryotic cells. When you look at the interior components, you see a fluid, and that's in the light bluish white color, and that's called cytoplasm or cytosol. And it's essentially made up of water along with some other complex material, and it suspends everything within the cell. Again, no matter what type of cell you are, you have cytoplasm. You also see these little dots suspended in the cytoplasm called ribosomes. And ribosomes are small structures where protein synthesis, so creating proteins, actually occurs. And it happens right on a little ribosome. So again, no matter what type of cell you are, you have ribosomes. And the lastly, every type of cell will have DNA or RNA as its genetic material. So a nucleic acid. So nucleic acid is usually found in the center of the cell. And again, we call it DNA or chromosomes. Um, sometimes you'll see it just referred to that way. But essentially, you can just say DNA. No matter what type of cell you are, you have DNA. Those are the four components that are always found in every cell. Cell membrane, ribosomes, cytoplasm, and DNA. Now, how a prokaryotic cell is simple is it doesn't have uh, anything encasing or surrounding the DNA in a membrane. Um, instead, the DNA is just splotched in the middle of the cell, and the region where it's held is called the nucleoid region. So that's what prokaryotic cells have in the center of the cell. It's not a defined um, membrane encasing the DNA. You can also look in the cytoplasm, and there's really nothing else in there, um, just fluid that's containing the ribosomes. So that's what makes it quite simple. So Following the cell membrane, right on top of it, we have another layer in blue here, and it's called the cell wall. And so the cell wall is added protection for this prokaryotic cell. This prokaryotic cell uh, is one that usually makes up bacteria, and so bacteria exist in harsh environments and usually as single cells. And because of that, they need an added layer of protection, and that's called a cell wall. So you, you will find that in prokaryotic cells. Uh, the cell membrane, just quickly going back to that, don't forget that it's made up of a phospholipid bilayer. So when we discussed macromolecules and talked about lipids, phospholipids are types of macromolecules that make up the cell membrane. And they are arranged in a bilayer which is a double layer um, in the cell membrane. And it's through these little phospholipids that different proteins and other items can enter the cell and leave the cell, and really how cells communicate and send messages to each other. So the cell membrane is really important for trafficking what is coming into the cell and what is leaving the cell, especially with respect to nutrients um, entering the cell and waste leaving the cell. So we have the cell membrane, the cell wall, and the third layer that you see here that's much larger is called a capsule, and it's again specific to bacteria or prokaryotic cells, and it's just another layer of protection that many prokaryotic cells will have. Again, because they exist in harsh environments, they need that added layer of protection. Sometimes this can be called a slime layer, and it can be uh, described as that in books because it is made up of a slimy material. Extend extending off of the capsule, you can see these little fibers. Um, and I believe this is mislabeled here. Uh, because these little fibers are actually called cilia, C-I-L-I-A. And a lot of these little fibers put together make up cilia, and cilia are used for mobility of the cell. So it helps the cell move slowly in, in its environment. So it kind of pushes the cell forward as you have a lot of these little uh, extensions off of the capsule. Now, prokaryotic cells, as we see this label called pili, what, what a pili are, are, would be one extension, so off of the 
off of the capsule and stemming from the cell membrane of the cell. And the one extension would be used for a process called conjugation, which is bacterial sex. Um, so usually bacteria will reproduce all on their own. They'll just copy themselves, which is called asexual reproduction. But sometimes when you have two bacteria in the same environment, they may want to mate with each other. And so they use pili, which are special attachments on them, to mate and actually exchange pieces of their DNA with each other. And then this long tail here is called a flagellum. And a flagellum is a tail for whip-like or quick movement in the environment. So it's also a motility instrument, but it's for quick movement. And those are the general parts of a prokaryotic cell. Again, bacteria are made of prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells, on the other hand, are much more complex. And so this next image is of a eukaryotic animal cell. And so eukaryotic cells can be categorized as animal cells and plant cells because they have a little bit, uh, a, a few things that are a little bit different. But generally they have the same structure. And this structure is, a, is different than prokaryotic cells because just generally taking a look at this eukaryotic animal cell, you can see there's a lot inside of it as compared to a prokaryotic cell. So first of all, starting with the outside, we have that cell membrane. And again, that cell membrane here in yellow is composed of a double layer, so a bilayer of phospholipids. And that helps to traffic what's coming into the cell and what's leaving the cell. Now, we do not normally have a cell wall surrounding that. That would be specific to plant cells uh, on the next slide. So eukaryotic cells do not have cell walls. Now, if you go towards the center, you can see this large purple spot here, which would contain DNA or chromosomes. Um, so chromosomes are the specific terms of how DNA is wrapped up. And when you unwind a chromosome, it's called chromatin, which is why you see that information here. And when it's wrapped around special proteins called histones, uh, we call that chromatin. And then when it's more condensed, we call it chromosomes. So there's a lot of different terminology for DNA, but essentially it's all DNA. So you have DNA in the center of the cell. Now, surrounding that DNA, um, you have an envelope or a membrane. And that's, uh, that's what makes the cell very special, is that its DNA is encased in a membrane. And that membrane is called the nucleus. So the nucleus is where the DNA is housed in complex eukaryotic cells. The exact membrane itself uh, so the encasing is called the nuclear envelope. The very interior where the DNA is housed and where ribosomes are made um, is called the nucleolus. So the nucleolus is the very center of the nucleus. And then on the nuclear envelope, there are little holes called nuclear pores. That's how those ribosomes that are made in the nucleus can leave, find their way to the cytoplasm, and can actually work in the cytoplasm. Now, DNA can't leave through those nuclear pores. It's much too large. Um, so how DNA is actually copied into a protein on a ribosome in the cytoplasm is by making a copy of the DNA that's much smaller first. So in the nucleus, you first have to copy the DNA into a structure called RNA, which is a copy of the DNA. And the RNA is actually small enough such that it can leave the nucleus make its way to a ribosome in the cytoplasm, and then get copied and made into a protein. Remember, ribosomes are where protein synthesis occurs in the cell. So uh, moving along a little bit, we have these little structures called peroxisomes, which metabolize and get rid of waste, as well as lysosomes over here in pink, which help digest food and waste materials as well. So we have a couple of structures like that. Now, plant cells, you'll notice on the next slide, do not have lysosomes. Instead, they have similar vessels, um, which is the general term for these little storage sacs. 
and they have similar vessels, but they're not called lysosomes. They are, in fact, called lysosome-like vesicles. <clears throat> Stemming off of the nucleus, we have what's called an endoplasmic reticulum, outlined here. And this blue area down here is also part of the endoplasmic reticulum. It's physically attached to the nucleus. Now the endoplasmic reticulum here, where you see little red dots on it, surrounding all of it, that's called the rough ER, ER for endoplasmic reticulum. And here where it's just blue, it's called the smooth ER. Rough indicates that there are ribosomes embedded on it, which makes sense because the endoplasmic reticulum is where proteins are modified and stored uh, for some time. And so because of that, ribosomes would be embedded on the rough ER. The smooth ER is not involved in protein, um, protein production or protein modification. The smooth ER is involved in the synthesis of lipids. And so that is another macromolecule that's found in the cell. And so the smooth ER is specific to lipids, the rough ER is specific to protein. Here within the cell, we also have a little vesicles called vacuoles that transport things within the cell. We also have mitochondria, and mitochondria <coughs> are the sites of uh, cellular respiration. So they produce energy in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We also have this structure here called a Golgi apparatus in pink. And what happens in the Golgi apparatus is that once proteins are made on little ribosomes, those proteins are moved to the rough ER where they're modified, and then they're shipped to the Golgi apparatus. And what the Golgi apparatus does is it packages them into little vesicles, and it finds out where they need to go, and it will send them there in the cell or out out of the cell to another cell. And so the Golgi helps in modifying those proteins if any modifications need to happen, the proteins sent from the rough ER. And if it needs to, it will modify them, but more so it'll package them and send them wherever they need to go. So if we have a transport protein that needs to go to uh, another cell, it'll uh, it'll put it into a little storage sack and it'll send it out of the cell through the cell membrane. So remember the cell membrane is involved in trafficking what comes in and out of the cell. So the Golgi is the one that makes that little vesicle and sends it in, um, to another place. So the Golgi is often thought as the UPS system of the cell. It receives packages, stores them, and then ships them out of the cell. Uh, this, <clears throat> I noticed this word plasma membrane, and plasma membrane is another way of saying cell membrane, so your book happens to use the term plasma membrane, but I'll continue using the term cell membrane. And we have also a cytoskeleton in the cell. So cytoskeleton is much like the skeleton that builds up your body, so your bone structure. And the cytoskeleton is a series of different types of filaments and tubules that essentially provides the shape to the cell. And uh, these tubules and filaments are called microtubules, uh, intermediate filaments, and microfilaments. And centrosomes are also another type of <coughs> microtubule that are part of the cytoskeleton. And it's essentially little fibers within the cell that hold its shape so that it's able to have some structure and organization. Those are the general parts of an animal eukaryotic cell. <clears throat> Next a picture that I have is that of a plant cell. And this is also a eukaryotic cell, and it looks a lot like the previous one in the image, but there are a little bit or a few differences. Firstly, looking at the exterior, it still has a cell membrane here in green, but it has a larger area outside of it, this larger green space here, which is the cell wall. So plants will always have a cell wall to help maintain their shape. Likewise, plants will have a mitochondria, 
or several mitochondria within the cell, but they'll also have a structure here in green called chloroplasts, and chloroplasts are the sites for photosynthesis. So plants are able to take energy from the sun and convert it to energy of the cell, and so they need chloroplasts in order to perform that function. Plants as well have the nucleus, which contains DNA. They also have the rough ER and the smooth ER, and they also have a Golgi apparatus. Likewise, they have ribosomes suspended in their cytoplasm in order to perform protein synthesis. It should be noted that um, these plant cells also have a structure known as a central vacuole and animal cells do not have a, st a structure called a central vacuole. This is very specific to plants. And so this central vacuole can make up 50 to 90% of the interior of a plant cell. And it's uh, filled with cell sap, so a variety of enzymes within a, uh, a water-based substance that helps <coughs> in terms of dealing with osmotic pressure in the cell. Other than that, um, they are quite similar. Again, the parts of the nucleus are similar. They have a nucleolus and an envelope and pores on the envelope. And they are attached to each other. So unlike animal cells, animal cells are not attached to each other, but plant cells, cells stay attached to each other. And they have certain channels that connect them to each other, and these are called plasmodismata. And these little channels, which you can probably see here and here, would be attached to um, other plant cells. Something interesting of note is that we know that DNA is stored in the nucleus uh, within both animal and plant cells. But what's interesting that has come out in the last few years is the importance of DNA that's stored in mitochondria. So you know that we have mitochondria in the cell, which are involved in production of energy <clears throat> in animals and in plants. And plants have chloroplasts, which are sites for photosynthesis. So actually, mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA. And this points to the history of how, we, how and why we have these structures in our cells. It used to be thought that mitochondria were their own prokaryotic organisms. And as evolution occurred, eukaryotic precursor cells picked up and ate the mitochondria, and then it became part of a more complex cell called the eukaryotic cell. And so that's why um, scientists believe mitochondria retained their own DNA. But what's really interesting is that mitochondrial DNA, unlike the nuclear DNA you have in your nucleus is only passed down through mothers. And so it's maternally inherited only. Whereas your nuclear DNA, you get half from your mom and half from your dad. But your mitochondrial DNA, you only receive from your mom. And uh, scientists use <clears throat> mitochondrial DNA to trace back ancestry. And so some companies uh, like 23andMe, they trace back or can trace back your ancestry based on your mitochondrial DNA. Now, uh, DNA in mitochondria does actually have a purpose. There are some specific mitochondrial diseases that occur because DNA in mitochondria is mutated. And if you can imagine it's only passed on from your mom, that means if your mom has a mitochondrial disease, you will have a mitochondrial disease because you won't get any mitochondria from the dad. And so in order to alleviate mitochondrial diseases, what the UK did just a couple of years ago is they approved the first three-parent embryo. So they would take an embryo, or I should say they would take an egg from a, a female, a, an individual who wanted to be a mother. So they would take her egg where she knew she had a mitochondrial disease and they would take out the diseased mitochondria. 
They would then take a donor or a surrogate mother, so some other female that would donate her healthy mitochondria, so she knew she didn't have a mitochondrial disease, and they would take that from her cell and insert it into the maternal original mother. And so then in a petri dish, much like in vitro fertilization, you can then take that egg, which now has a donor mitochondria, and then you can fertilize it with the dad's sperm. And so in such a way, you are getting rid or alleviating the problem of inheriting mitochondrial diseases in families. But a lot has come out of that in terms of legal ramifications, in terms of is this now a third parent, given that the donor mother or the donor uh, female had contributed DNA to this embryo. And so there's a lot to be worked out with that. And I do not believe that has been approved in the US yet. But that is something that is being done in other areas of the world right now. So going back to cells, um, it would be helpful to do a cell comparison. And you can use this table in the slide as an outline of um, how you can compare different types of cells. So firstly, looking at prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. How are they similar and how are they different? A couple of things that I can note that are similar are those that I mentioned initially. So cytoplasm, the cell membrane, ribosomes, and DNA or chromosomes, those are all found in any type of cell. Differences would be a prokaryotic cell is much more simple and a, and a eukaryotic is, a cell is much more complex. So in order to write a proper difference, you have to say what's happening in one cell versus the other. So you would say prokaryotic cells are simple, whereas eukaryotic cells are more complex. Uh, something that I didn't mention was that in evolutionary time, prokaryotic cells appeared first. So that's another difference, uh, that prokaryotic cells appeared first in evolutionary time and eukaryotic cells appeared later. Likewise, prokaryotic cells do not have organelles, and organelles are the organs found in a cell. They are things like lysosomes, mitochondria, ruffiar, smoothiar, Golgi apparatus, um, and anything else you can think of that's found inside of the cell, suspended in the cytoplasm. So it is perfectly appropriate to say prokaryotic cells do not have organelles, whereas eukaryotic cells do have organelles. And you can go ahead and think of some more differences and similarities as you look through the pictures and read through the textbook chapters. Now, in terms of animal versus plant cells, they do have many similarities. They share uh, a nucleus or they have a nucleus in common. Uh, they both have rough ER, smooth ER, Golgi. Um, they both have vesicles inside. Uh, so they really do have many similarities, as well as cytoplasm, cytoskeleton, and cell membrane. Now, in terms of the differences, animal cells contain lysosomes, whereas plant cells do not. Um, similarly, plant cells contain chloroplasts, whereas animal cells do not. And plant cells contain or have a cell wall, whereas animals do not. Um, something I didn't mention, and it's not shown in the pictures of the animal cell, but if you go back to the animal cell, there are some instances where some animal eukaryotic cells have a flagella, so a little tail, but generally they don't. So if you wanted to say that prokaryotic cells, going back to this table, have flagella and cilia, whereas eukaryotic cells generally do not, that would be an appropriate difference. So again, go through the images and see if you can find some more differences and similarities between animal cells and plant cells. So that's what I wanted to wrap up with. If you have any questions about cells and how to observe cells, please let me know. Thank you.